electronic stuff. Oh yeah, recording is uh, the talk is now recorded, and <laughs> but I had not said nothing very important up to now. So uh, the point is that really machine learning is something that should be used, in my opinion, beside uh, electronic structure and uh, classical statistical sampling techniques. And uh, the idea is really that you know if you look uh, at the development of uh, uh, atomistic simulations of matter uh, you see a process in which you start back uh, in the uh, in the 50s with the introduction of extremely simplistic models of the interactions between the atoms you know combination of electrostatics bonded terms and so on and so forth and then these very simple functional forms were used uh, uh, not so much to predict the specific uh, behavior of one particular material, but more to understand uh, emergent uh, behavior at the atomic scale, say phase transitions, uh, uh, collisions, uh, radiation damage, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, uh, you know, following on from this uh, seminal work, uh, people started to try and be a little bit more ambitious and uh, introduce electronic structure methods that you know are uh, computationally uh, expensive, but allow you to obtain quantitative accuracy without any fit to experiments and really be able to predict the properties of a material without even having ever made the material. And this is really what uh, pushed uh, the high throughput materials discovery revolution where you really design materials using uh, simulations because you can predict exactly how a certain material will behave. Now, if you look at the vast majority of high throughput calculations, uh, they focus on you know, screening uh, idealized uh, crystalline structures. Uh, and uh, this is because, uh, you know, Electronic structure calculations, uh, even though they have become much cheaper, they are still very time consuming. And unfortunately, uh, very often, uh, real materials, real molecules uh, in, uh, in realistic experimental conditions uh, are much more complicated than that. They are dirty, they contain impurities, uh, they uh, undergo thermal and quantum mechanical fluctuations. And so if you really want to get quantitative accuracy, it's not enough to be accurate on the uh, electronic structure side, you also need to be accurate in sampling. And this means that, for instance, you need to collect enough statistics to sample all of the different pathways that can contribute to a phase transition. And, you know, more in general, I would say that even though it has now become possible to get accurate predictive modeling of uh, idealized material structures, if you want to get uh, emergent physical behavior from first principles, this is still very, very much challenging. And this is where, in my opinion, machine learning can really help a lot. Because essentially, the core idea behind machine learning is that you establish relationships with structures, you know, uh, molecules or materials characterized by the nature and the position of the atoms. And uh, you establish a relationship with the properties associated with this structure. Let's say, for instance, the interatomic potential. So rather than doing ab initio molecular dynamics by computing over and over the born oppenheimer potential energy surface for different structures, you use a surrogate quantum model, which is based purely on data-driven techniques that allow you to estimate the potential uh, much, much, much more cheaply. And one aspect that I will tell you about today is that more recently, you know, machine learning potentials are kind of well established now, but more and more it's becoming possible to predict not only the potential, but also all the nice functional properties that you can get from electronic structure calculations. So how does this, uh, you know, uh, structure property uh, relationship uh, uh, prediction works? Uh, the idea is actually very simple, and uh, the idea is essentially that you uh, determine a functional form to approximate the relationship between your structures, or better, some input features, a vector of number that describes the composition and the geometry of your configuration, 
And, and then for a given training set, you try to adjust the parameters in this functional form to match the value of the properties that you have computed from first principles. So, you know, machine learning doesn't eliminate the need for electronic structure calculations. It acts as an amplifier that allows you to, you know, to use up better a small number of very accurate reference calculations. And then, you know, you need to choice, uh, you need to make a choice for the functional form of this uh, approximate uh, relationship between the structure and the property. And there is a lot of freedom in here. And you can go from very simple model, even linear regression, actually many times it works best, to something more sophisticated, some kind of a fancy uh, transformer architecture or whatever. And sort of the, the, the take home message that I want to pass from this slide is that the choice of the complexity of the model is not neutral and it's not just a choice of uh, more complex is better because usually more complex models, uh, they are more flexible and allow you to get better uh, limiting accuracy, but they also require much more data. And since typically accurate electronic structure calculations are still pretty demanding, uh, you rarely get into the regime in which you can really consider training data to be uh, for free. And so simpler models can actually be more effective. So another aspect that you can use machine learning for, and that I will cover a little bit less, but is also very important, is that as simulations uh, try to tackle emergent physical phenomena, they become more complicated. And even understanding what's going on in a calculation or what are the most important properties of a high throughput uh, uh, database of materials become far from trivial. And you can also use machine learning as a sort of a visualization tool to simplify the description of a complex free energy or potential energy landscape. And here, for instance, you see a two dimensional map of the folding landscape of a small protein that allows you to understand that it, this uh, protein that has a beta hairpin as a native structure can actually also misfold in a number of different ways. And you can understand a little bit better uh, the biophysics of this system. And here is another example. And this is a database of hypothetical carbon allotropes that through the lens of a machine learning analysis, uh, become nicely organized in a way that reveals the relationship between structure and stability. So here the points are colored according to the energy. And you see that you know the more stable structures are graphitic or diamond-like, but you also have all sorts of uh, defective and one-dimensional structure. And since this is a initial random structure search, you even get a simple cubic uh, uh, carbon, which of course, it's not very stable, but it's one of the possible structures that you can get. Uh, and machine learning reveals really, really nicely uh, how these uh, uh, high energy structures are outliers and more of a quirk of the uh, search technique than something that really uh, is very crucial to understand the properties of carbon. So in all of these techniques uh, that from a very abstract perspective can be seen as looking for patterns in the relationship between structures and uh, target properties, a crucial role is played by the representation. So the representation, what I call representation, is essentially a mathematical formulation of the uh, chemical and geometric nature of your uh, uh, input structures. And depending on the machine learning technique that you use, there are different families of representation. So you can have feature vectors, basically literally a vector of numbers that you associate to each configuration. Or you could choose to use distances, so basically to measure the similarity between two configurations, or kernels that essentially uh, correspond to scalar products between the entities that you associate with individual structures. So uh, depending on the machine learning technique, you might hear speaking about descriptor features, uh, matrix distances, or kernels, but you can always interconvert one form into another. So it doesn't really matter too much. You can just think of these as different ways of 
formulating a mathematical description of a structure so that it can be used most efficiently as the input of a machine learning technique. So uh, representations are particularly important uh, when you want to perform a regression task where you want to learn the relationship between a structure and its properties. And actually, uh, choosing wisely your representation is very important because this allows you to uh, encode some essential physical requirements uh, into the form of uh, the features. So basically, the task of building a representation corresponds to mapping uh, uh, structures, so geometric arrangements of atoms uh, into a feature space. And anything that you do uh, downstream, any machine learning model that you do uh, is built uh, on top of this feature space. So anything that you do in this mapping uh, will be naturally inherited uh, by your machine learning model uh, for the good or for the bad. So for instance, uh, uh, if you build a representation that is not complete, so if you build a representation where two distinct structures are mapped to the same feature vector, then nothing you can do at the level of the machine learning model will allow you to predict the different energies for those two structures. At the same time, if you can build a representation that is symmetric, so that structures that are related by trivial symmetry operations like a rigid rotation are mapped to the same point in future space, your machine learning model will not have to learn that rotating a molecule doesn't change its energy. If you get a descriptor that is smooth, you will have more naturally a machine learning model that is smooth. And most of the structural property relationships at the atomic level are indeed smooth. And another requirement, which is perhaps a little bit less obvious, is to build the descriptor for a structure as a combination, an additive combination of local terms. So why are additivity and locality important? Well, essentially because since there has been modeling techniques, uh, people have been decomposing uh, the extensive properties of a system, let's say its potential energy, into a sum of atom-centered contributions. This is true for pair potentials, but it's also true of more complicated potentials. You always try to build them such that the energy of a big structure can be decomposed as a sum of local terms. And actually, if you make these ansatz for your target property, so your potential, for instance, this actually implies additive ansatz also for the feature vectors. So basically, the feature vector associated with your structure must be a sum of feature vectors associated with, additive, uh, with local uh, environments. And the kernel between two structures must be written as a sum of local kernels between atom-centered environments. So basically, this idea of additivity has a consequence in terms of the structure of your representation, and actually has also advantages in terms of the transferability of your model, because essentially an additive construction allows you to implement a divide and conquer modeling strategy. And you know, pictorially, you could see this as allowing you to learn structure property relationships from small models, and then be able to break those small models apart and put them together into more complicated and potentially more useful forms. So um, actually these uh, symmetries and these uh, requirements for the construction of the representation are so important that you could use them to classify uh, the different uh, frameworks that have been proposed over the past 10 years to build uh, representations. And, and actually you can find that, uh, and this is you know, just a small uh, selection of representations that have been proposed. So this is, you know, it's a bit of circular logic perhaps, but this is a argument to highlight how important the representation construction is. The fact that everybody is trying to build one. And, and actually not only you can organize these representations based on the application of symmetry operations, but you can also realize that the vast majority of these representations 
due to the fact that they've been developed to fulfill the same goals, they actually ended up being the same thing. So you can construct in a sort of generic way uh, some objects uh, that correspond to endpoint correlations of the atom density. I don't have really the time to get into the details. You know, if you're interested into this kind of formal view uh, of the construction of uh, uh, descriptors for machine learning, we have a recent review on the topic. But basically, all of these representations that I've put as the leaves of this tree uh, can be seen as uh, endpoint correlations of the atom density centered uh, and projected on uh, a, a particular choice of a basis set. And you can uh, generalize this construction actually not only to build uh, descriptors that are symmetric with respect to uh, symmetry operations, but also that are equivariant. And I will tell you a little bit more what equivariant means uh, in a few slides. And you can also generalize this construction to build the descriptors that can go beyond a purely local uh, representation, which is, of course, very important if you want to do uh, to learn something long range. And uh, something very recent that is basically appeared uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have also shown uh, that many more sophisticated machine learning schemes, such as message passing equivariant frameworks, can be understood in appropriate limits as generalizations of these construction that can be used to build local descriptors of atomic structures. So this whole fundamental development effort has actually led to machine learning being really incorporated in the day-to-day -day practice of atomistic modeling. And this is particularly true when it comes to potentials and to the calculation of thermodynamic properties. So uh, an example I really like to show is this paper of ours from 2019, in which we computed the finite temperature thermodynamics of water and uh, the, um, you know, the ambient pressure ice phases of, of water, uh, the hexagonal and cubic forms of ice. And the way we managed to compute the full ab initio thermodynamic properties of these uh, uh, different phases of water was essentially by first sampling the thermodynamics of the different phases using a machine learning potential, and then because of the need to really achieve exquisite level of accuracy, which is not yet uh, to uh, the reach of machine learning potentials, uh, we use the free energy perturbation to promote the uh, machine learning free energies to the full ab initio level. And what is nice is that you can really see, well, you can see, first of all, that you need uh, this uh, uh, free energy perturbation to correct uh, uh, the machine learning free energy, otherwise you get an error in the estimation of the thermodynamic properties. And also you can include all the effects that you like. You know, you can include the quantum fluctuations of the nucleus, so you can get a difference in melting point between H2O and H2O, and you can compute this very subtle difference in free energy between the hexagonal and cubic form of ice, which is a very, very difficult quantity to compute uh, because you really, you, you know, look at the scale, you need a precision of a few million, of less than a milliliter volt per molecule, essentially. So uh, I'm happy to say that also thanks, you know, to four mem members of the lab who have, you know, now perfected these uh, techniques, uh, now you can do these kind of finite temperature thermodynamics, including quantum effects and all these subtle physical uh, terms, uh, also for much more complicated systems and water, you can do molecular crystals, you can do metals, you name it. And you can also start uh, uh, making links with experiments. And for instance, you can compute uh, also experimental observables such as NMR chemical shieldings of uh, uh, nuclei in uh, crystalline phases. And these are routinely used to perform what is called NMR crystallography. So basically structure determination through NMR spectroscopies. And these 
relies very heavily on uh, DFT as a reference uh, technique to compute the chemical shieldings uh, of hypothetical structures uh, to find the one that matches best uh, uh, the experimental shieldings. And basically now we have a machine learning model that we call shift ML that reaches the same level of accuracy of DFT with respect to experiments and allows you to accelerate greatly crystal structure determination uh, using this combination of theory and, uh, and experiments. And another nice thing that you can do uh, is to combine uh, sampling of finite temperature thermodynamics, in this case for uh, molecular crystals, uh, with calculation of the uh, properties, in this case, uh, the chemical shieldings. Uh, and you can see, I mean, it's a complicated figure. We compare many different uh, uh, approximations to the chemical shieldings of the nuclei. But you see that systematically incorporating uh, uh, thermal and quantum fluctuations of the nuclei improves uh, the accuracy of predictions with respect to experiments. So I mentioned before the possibility of using machine learning not just uh, as a, a technique to complement uh, and partly substitute electronic structure calculations, uh, but it's also a technique that you can really try to use to understand better uh, the structure property relationships uh, in the class of materials that you're studying. And here, for instance, I'm showing a map uh, of the different polymorphs of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is a, um, a substituted pentacene uh, molecule. And uh, you can really see how these polymorphs uh, organize themselves uh, when seen through the lens of machine learning descriptors uh, into clusters uh, that can be related to sort of heuristic uh, classes of uh, uh, molecular materials. And you can also relate uh, to the stability of different assembly. You can really understand them in terms of the hydrogen bond motifs and in terms of the pi pi stacking. And you can use these also to recognize, uh, and this is still a work in progress, but you can use it to classify and recognize binding patterns in molecular crystals. So you can sort of try and generalize the uh, rules of thumb that you know, something like hydrogen bonding is good for stability, you can generalize these and find uh, more nuanced classifications of different patterns. For instance, you can look at uh, aromatic uh, motifs and realize that yes, very often, uh, aromatic motifs contribute to the stability of the molecular crystal. But when you have aromatic systems that are also substituted with very bulky uh, side groups, the aromatic, the rigidity of the aromatic system will actually become a problem for the stability of the crystal because it will make it harder for the bulky groups to find a good way to arrange themselves. And you can find these just automatically just by looking as a side product of a machine learning analysis of the stability of these crystals. And um, you can also um, combine uh, these uh, analysis of uh, uh, structural motifs uh, with analysis of structural property relation. And this, again, for molecular crystal, uh, shows how you can predict uh, some of the central quantities for uh, computing the, uh, the electron mobility. Uh, in uh, organic uh, materials for organic electronics. And then uh, you can visualize a map of the structure uh, energy property landscape for a family of these uh, uh, molecular compounds. Uh, and you can uh, uh, inspect them to realize what are the motifs uh, that are connected with an increase of uh, electron mobility. And so you can, this can help you design better materials for a given application. So after this uh, sort of intermission on applications, uh, I want to get back uh, a little bit uh, to the theory of uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, models and machine le learning representations. Uh, and in particular, 
uh, since you probably have heard, uh, if you're following the field, you have heard quite a bit about equivariant machine learning models. I want to tell you a little bit how to build equivariant representations and what it really means and why it's useful and important to, to build equivariant models. So equivariance is essentially a, a generalization of the concept of invariance. If you look at the energy of a molecule, it doesn't change when you rotate the molecule. But if you look at something like the molecular dipole, if you rotate the molecule, the, mole the dipole moment will rotate, but it will rotate in a very precise way. It will rotate according to the same rotation matrix that determines the rotation of the molecular geometry. So you can try to build a machine learning model, if you want to call it a machine learning model, of the dipole moment. So this is basically the X, Y, and Z components of the dipole moment of molecule AI. And we can try to write a linear regression model. So this is kind of a fancy notation to express a linear regression model in which these are the regression weights summed over the feature components that are enumerated by Q. And the point is that since we are trying to predict a vector, each of the features must be itself a vector. If you build a, a, a machine learning model with this form and you ask yourself, okay, what happens when I rotate my molecule? This translates basically given that the, uh, the regression weight doesn't depend on rotation, it all hinges on how the representation changes upon rotation of the molecule. And if you can build a representation that transforms under rotation, like uh, based on the application of rotation matrix, then you get a model that automatically will rotate in the correct way when you rotate your molecule. So you can see this as basically the essence of an equivariant machine learning model. It's a model that upon a rotation of the inputs uh, applies automatically the appropriate rotation to the vectorial components of your uh, targets. And you can use this model to build uh, a machine learning scheme for molecular dipoles that works very well. And what is a little bit more complicated, but has essentially the same structure and functions in exactly the same spirit, you can generalize this construction to build models that are equivariant for any sort of tensorial quantity. And to do that, you basically need to build models that transform like spherical harmonics, because the spherical harmonics give you um, a irreducible representation of the rotation group. And so you can represent any object that transforms under rotations as a combination of objects that transform like spherical harmonics. And you can use this, for instance, uh, switching back a little bit to applications to build machine learning models of molecular polarizabilities that are trained on couple cluster calculations of polarizabilities and that can actually predict on much larger molecules than those that have been trained on with the accuracy that is better than the accuracy of DFT relative to a couple of clusters. So basically you can really build a machine learning model that is more accurate than DFT because you can afford training it on a small number of couple of cluster uh, calculations. And then you have enough flexibility to predict on larger and more interesting molecules. So once you have something that can predict spherical harmonics, you can also use it to predict electronic structure properties. So quantities that are built as a superimposition of spherical harmonics themselves. So you can, for instance, machine learn uh, the electron charge density, for both molecules and condensed phases. And you can build the machine learning models of a single particle effective Hamiltonians. Effectively, uh, you, know, you could regard these as uh, a tie binding Hamiltonian, essentially, or a Huckel Hamiltonian. And uh, something which is very, very nice, and the reason why I'm showing this example, is that since we build a machine learning model that is fully equivariant, uh, the model knows about molecular orbital theory 
without having to incorporate it manually. So here, for instance, we are trying to build a machine learning model for the Huckel Hamiltonian of benzene, which has the D6H symmetry. And uh, we did this uh, sort of uh, funny exercise of trying to learn a matrix uh, filled with random numbers. And if you try to learn a matrix filled with random numbers, the model just cannot learn it because these random numbers are incompatible with the symmetry of the molecule. So the part that you can fit is actually symmetric and has the right uh, degeneracies and uh, the right um, symmetries of the eigenvectors, even though the matrix had been built with just random numbers. Um, and other examples, and I mean, the message here is that, uh, so implementation is still a little bit hit and miss, but uh, we are really getting to the point where you can do with machine learning everything that you used to be able to do with a initial molecular dynamics. You want to study the uh, uh, polarization of uh, a ferroelectric, you can do that uh, using uh, a model of the interatomic potential, but also a model of the polarization built with the same machine learning techniques. You want to study the finite temperature heat capacity in uh, a metal, you can do that without having to do electronic search calculations to compute the density of states because uh, you can train a machine learning model and use it to predict uh, the electronic density of states uh, uh, for you know for molten nickel uh, in the high temperature regime and you what is nice is that this allows you to also bring the advantages of machine learning essentially uh, the more benign scaling with system size and the possibility of targeting high uh, levels of electronic search theory upon training you can transfer the level of accuracy that has been now reached for machine learning potentials to also the prediction of functional properties. So you can predict, for instance, the conductivity of amorphous silicon as it undergoes phase transitions at high pressure. And you know, speaking about matter at extreme conditions, this is an archive paper that we published last week, uh, in which we show how you can do finite electron temperature molecular dynamics uh, using a combination of uh, a machine learning potential trained uh, at uh, zero Kelvin, uh, you know, at zero electronic temperature, and uh, the density of states uh, computed at zero electronic temperature. So basically, with a training set that is entirely consistent, built out of ground state calculations, uh, you can build a machine learning model that allows you to simulate matter at, uh, you know, uh, at, at the core of Jupiter kind of uh, uh, conditions. Uh, you can also, and this is another example of what you can do nowadays, uh, let's say that you want to compute uh, uh, some experimental observables like the infrared or Raman spectra. In this case, this is done for liquid water, but you could really do this for all sorts of other uh, molecular compounds. Uh, you can do these calculations by computing both the potential and the dipole moment or the polarizability surfaces with a machine learning technique. And this is so inexpensive that we can actually also incorporate quantum fluctuations of the nuclei. And we can afford to compare the results with two different types of reference DFT calculations because this is trained on a couple of thousand reference structures. So, you know, you can really compare different DFTs for kind of calculations that would have been really prohibitively expensive if we had done them directly uh, with, uh, uh, with DFT. So up to now, lots of success stories, but how about uh, uh, electrostatics, because all that I have discussed up to now relies on these uh, locality ansatz. And uh, uh, those of you who are a little bit familiar with uh, performing calculations for charged systems, uh, they know that probably this is not very easy to generalize this to ionic systems, for instance. And indeed, uh, one thing that you can do to try and gauge how local is actually local is to try and 
uh, build machine learning models with different cutoff distances. This is actually a very instructive exercise because you can artificially restrict the amount of information that you incorporate in the model to two Ongstrom, 2.5, three up to five Ongstrom and above if you want the distances. And then if you look at the accuracy of these models, and in particular, you look at learning curves, which are the accuracy of the model as a function of the uh, size of the training set. So how many uh, reference calculations you have used to train the model, you see that for a short range cutoff, you get a model that is actually extremely efficient in learning with a small number of reference calculations. And actually, this is not so surprising because here we are trying to learn the cohesive energy of small organic molecules and the large fraction of the cohesive energy is encoded in the covalent bonds. And with a true strong cutoff, you can describe most covalent bonds and you are kind of not distracted by longer range correlations if you only use a short range cutoff. However, if you have a lot of data, you see that the learning curve saturates because it just doesn't have enough information to describe hydrogen bonds or electrostatic interactions. And so, you know, you could think of just increasing progressively the cutoff radius and perhaps building multi-scale models in which you combine descriptors or kernels built at different length scales and you tune the relative weights so that they reflect the importance of different contributions. And this does indeed improve the data efficiency and the ultimate accuracy of the model, because basically you build a model that ref reflects better uh, the underlying uh, physics of the system. So if you thought of following this program, so you know, increasing progressively the cutoff distance, uh, to deal with electrostatics, uh, you would be in for uh, very bad surprises. And this is an example from which typical uh, undergraduate solid state chemistry um, textbook example, where you try to compute the cohesive energy of sodium chloride. And uh, what is interesting is that if you perform the summation and you try to converge the summation by incorporating interactions up to a certain distance, and you try to do that summing over spheres or over cubes of increasing size, not only this converges slowly, but it converges to a different limit depending on whether you sum over spheres or over cubes. And this gives you a very striking example of the pathological behavior of one over R interactions and why uh, capturing long range effects with the local model no matter how large a cutoff you choose, is hopeless. You really would need to get a cutoff distance of hundreds of Ohmstroms to even get close to capturing accurately electrostatic interactions. So here we tried something a little bit different. And, um, and so basically, yeah, no, I just wanted to say that you also find the other types of issues, for instance, if you try to predict uh, the dipole moment of uh, uh, conjugated systems where you have charge transfer, it's very difficult uh, to predict that with a purely local model and you really need to build uh, uh, models that also incorporate uh, somehow this uh, uh, non-locality and this long range charge transfer. Uh, this is also true if you look at something like uh, uh, polarizability of conjugated systems, Particularly in DFT, if you have a perfectly conjugated polyacetylene molecule, uh, as you make it longer and longer, it will become a metal. And so, strictly speaking, the polarizability becomes infinite. And so it's very hard to learn this kind of behavior with a purely local model. Uh, so the idea that we had was to try and build local representations that incorporate some uh, aspects of long range interactions and in particular incorporate the correct uh, asymptotic behavior. And the way we did this uh, was with a sort of a, I think it's a very nice trick, which is that we start from this uh, decorated atom density that we use to describe the local term. 
and we solve the Poisson equation for it. We compute the potential associated with this fictitious potential. This is not at all a real potential. This is just, uh, you know, we have a different potential for each species. This is just a way of describing a structure in such a way that a deformation of an atom here will be felt also in the far field with the correct one over R asymptotics. And then once you have this global uh, fictitious uh, potential, what you do is you symmetrize this potential which leads again to atom-centered descriptors that then have all the advantages in terms of transferability that you get from uh, local machine learning models. And this can be evaluated, this, you know, this uh, uh, reciprocal space uh, uh, a reciprocal space trick allows you to evaluate this uh, uh, global potential very efficiently. And so uh, you can try this idea on, uh, and if you do this on charged interactions, it works beautifully because we are basically incorporating exactly one over R asymptotics. So the model extrapolates very, very nicely uh, to the asymptotic uh, dissociated regime. But what is also very interesting is that also for different kinds of interactions that are not necessarily uh, point charge electrostatics, uh, the machine learning model is sufficiently flexible to also learn this kind of different uh, asymptotic behaviors and can even learn uh, the interactions between uh, polar uh, residues. So to give you uh, some kind of, you know, a wrap up and an outlook of where I see this uh, going. So all of these developments have happened very, very fast. These, these are fields that moves at a speed which is really, really hard to keep up with. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to predict in the long term what comes next. And so what I'm trying to think uh, is really how uh, one can you know, what happens once this is not anymore a very much overhyped field, but will have uh, uh, finished turning into a tool that is used day to day into the practice of everyone doing atomic scale calculations. And so one aspect on which we are working and I really want to work uh, is basically try to, you know, not just uh, uh, give people a, a full-fledged uh, machine learning scheme, you know, uh, Gaussian approximation potentials, Beller Parinello neural networks. These are kind of uh, packages that all already combine many different choices of representation, of regression model, uh, of uh, optimizer, and they are sort of tuned to work well together. And these, I think, are very, very useful for the community. However, what we are trying to do is to understand the ingredients that go into these uh, uh, machine learning models and try to uh, understand how they work, understand what are the best way of combining them together so that we can basically give all the ingredients back to the community and everybody can make their own mix uh, in the way that suits best their taste and the uh, problem that they're trying to solve. And to make it easier for people <coughs> outside my group to do this, we're really trying to develop all of these uh, uh, techniques uh, in a modular fashion. So we are not developing a monolithic package, but we really are working on different uh, uh, tools uh, that try to tackle, you know, sampling, uh, visualization, uh, post, post uh, processing, or uh, the construction of representations. And we also try to make these uh, as easy to integrate as possible with other tools that exist uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. So another aspect in which I really hope that we will see fast progress is uh, uh, what I call blurring the lines between machine learning and quantum mechanical calculations. So not only basically getting machine learning to be able to predict uh, all uh, the uh, final functional properties that you could dream of, uh, from polarization to NMR chemical shieldings, uh, uh, but also uh, 
allow you to basically predict intermediate ingredients of a quantum percolation. For instance, you know, predict the charge density to use it as the initialization of a much, you know, a self-consistent loop that you still do with full-fledged DFT because uh, perhaps, uh, you know, I have to admit that when you start uh, predicting the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, you know, these machine learning models start becoming expensive because, you know, at the end of the day, you have to deal with a large number of uh, coefficients. And so I, I'm not so sure that at the end of the day, a full-fledged machine learning model for the Hamiltonian is the right way to go. And so I would really like to have a modular framework in which you can mix and match machine learning and electronic structure methods as seamlessly as possible. And another aspect in which I'm really hoping to see fast progress is a combination of theory and experiments. And this is really challenging because uh, theory and experiments act on different objects. So when you do a quantum calculation, you predict the properties of a specific configuration of the atoms. But if you compute the chemical shieldings uh, sorry, if you measure the chemical shieldings of a molecule, uh, what you're measuring is the average over an ensemble of configurations that are sampled by the experiment. So on both a conceptual and a practical level, uh, this is kind of challenging and this is something on which I, I would really like to see uh, faster progress and it's something which we're working on. And so to sort of uh, uh, wrap up, so as also to leave uh, uh, 10 minutes in case, in case you have uh, any questions, uh, I think that machine learning is moving very fast, not only in delivering tools that you guys can use to reduce the cost of uh, performing simulations with electronic structure accuracy, uh, but there is also a lot of progress in understanding the fundamentals of uh, atomistic machine learning, which I think is, is useful and important uh, because it allows us uh, to make uh, uh, better informed choices. And there are some aspects in which I really think that machine learning is here and here to stay. And this is certainly true for the prediction of the thermodynamic properties of materials at finite temperature. If you uh, look uh, at only 10 years ago, and even five years ago, uh, the work of people like Jörg Neugebauer, who made fantastic work being able to compute from first principles the thermodynamics of defects uh, and the uh, melting point of metals, that's a lot of work and require a lot of smart tricks. And now with using machine learning potential, this has become much, much, much cheaper and easier. And I, I think that very soon, also all sorts of experimental observables will become accessible, uh, which is really going to simplify a lot of comparison between experiments and theory, because you, know, you don't need to do uh, electronic structure calculations to compute uh, the infrared spectrum of material and so on and so forth. So one problem that I don't think is entirely solved, even though there are many uh, potential solutions out there, is the problem of long range physics. And then there is a lot of work still to do, you know, in tuning, finding the best uh, uh, trade-offs between speed and accuracy, uh, in going, uh, you know, to intermediate levels of coarse graining, uh, uh, beyond uh, just you know building surrogate model of quantum uh, uh, calculations, but in all of these, uh, I really believe that you know not seeing data-driven models uh, and uh, physics-based models uh, as uh, antagonistic, but really as something working in synergy, exchanging ideas and trying to each to excel at what is best, I, I think is really the way forward and the way where I hope the field will move. So that's all that I wanted to tell you today. Uh, I, if you have any questions, otherwise, if you are really hungry and want to go get some food, I will perfectly understand. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Sorry, first, Michele, thank you very much. There's a request for your slides, so I hope you will share your slides with us. So they are not here yet, but I will upload them. And, you know, like in half an hour, you will be able to download them from tinyurl.com, Cheriotti 2022, Kigali.
Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. yes. Thank you, Professor, for the nice talk. Uh, please, if you can turn again the cutoff and show us how it's linked to the, uh, to the electrostatic uh, charges and the system and the system and the system and, and also. How does it influence the, 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 the system to the accuracy of the, the Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I went a little bit fast on this. So basically, so the vast majority of machine learning models, including the ones we use, uh, are based on assuming that uh, your uh, solid can be decomposed in a sort of atom-centered spheres. And the uh, the radius of this sphere is something that you can choose. And so this uh, allows you to basically then you train a machine learning model uh, using spheres of different radii. And then you can see how accurate your model is. And the message is that basically, you know, the larger the cutoff, uh, using a larger cutoff doesn't necessarily give you a better model. And this is because if you have a larger cutoff, you have many more atoms within the cutoff. And so your machine learning model is trying to interpolate a very complicated function of many, many uh, variables. So there is kind of a trade-off between the amount of information that you put in and the amount of data that you can afford to compute. So if you have only, uh, I would say, you know, exponentially decaying uh, in kind of interactions, uh, you can optimize your cutoff uh, and potentially use uh, multiple cutoffs uh, to find the best possible accuracy for a given amount of data. And the reason why I don't think that this is a good strategy to deal with electrostatics uh, is that basically when you really have electrostatic contributions, uh, they are very long ranged, so much long ranged that, that First of all, it would be very expensive to compute. Imagine, so computing these descriptors uh, scales uh, linearly, formally scales linearly with the number of neighbors. Uh, but in practice, uh, you, if you have a larger cutoff, you also need more descriptors. So actually the cost uh, of the calculations uh, scale uh, not so well with the, with the cutoff radius. And, and so basically, I think that if you want to describe electrostatics, uh, you need uh, longer ray, you need a different technique. Now, how much does this matter? Actually, we need to go back to water. So the first time that you know I started working on this uh, uh, with Jörg Beller, and when he told me that, you know, yeah, let's go and, and do a machine learning potential for water. I was like, wait a minute, you know, water is so much dominated by electrostatics. It's crazy to do a model of water that doesn't incorporate some kind of long range physics. And the point is that actually these long range effects, if you have a bulk system, they are not so large. And, uh, and actually, you know, you can see these here uh, here, basically, the blue dashed curve is the result that we get with the pure neural network potential without the free energy perturbation that allows us to incorporate electrostatics as a correction, because, you know, of course, the DFT incorporates electrostatics. And you see that, you know, yes, there is a noticeable error, some, uh, uh, something like... Uh, uh, you know, five Kelvin uh, for water and uh, um, a few, a fraction of a million electron volt per atom per, uh, for the relative free energy of the two ice forms. 
so you see, it's small in these cases, and it, we only need the correction because we are really after very, very high levels of accuracy. If you have in homogeneous systems, like a molecule interacting with a surface, for instance, then it will become much, much harder to do without electrostatics. I don't know if this answers your question. If I may, it's Gianmarco Ignanese here. Uh, hey. Following on this, uh, on this question, um, the way you handle that is that in some way you do the long range first, or I, you know, you were quite fast on <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. Here, actually, so you, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit schizophrenic. So on one hand, uh, we are doing all of this very uh, mathy uh, and uh, very sophisticated uh, feature development efforts, but at the end of the day, when we are trying to do to solve a material science problem, uh, we are being very, very pragmatic. So here, what we do is basically. Uh, we do the sampling at the uh, machine learning level, mm -hmm. and then uh, we correct uh, the finite temperature thermodynamics uh, uh, with free energy perturbation. So basically, uh, you, you have the structures that you have sampled uh, at the machine learning level. You do a few hundred uh, single point uh, DFT calculations, uh, and you can use these uh, uh, basically to correct uh, a exact thermodynamic uh, correction. This is basically uh, the log of the average of e to the minus beta, the difference between DFT and uh, uh, the machine learning potential. And, you know, this, yes, this requires a few hundred additional single point calculations, uh, but, you know, it's much less effort than uh, coming up and implementing efficiently uh, a way to incorporate long range electrostatics to get this last uh, mile, this last bit. What you were showing about the potential then, what, what was that? You know, the one where you reimpose the symmetry of the potential, maybe I misunderstood. So, the, so the, the, the potential is symmetric by construction because the machine learning potential is symmetric by construction because yet, I mean, you, you showed something about uh, I think some, it is atom center. Yeah, when you once you did the atom in your presentation, at some stage you you spoke about this about uh, going from the potential. Sorry, from the density. Oh, here, 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 here. Yes, yes. Okay, I see. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah this part. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So here, basically, now this this potential is not symmetric in the sense that it's, you know, if I'm taking it as a descriptor of my structure, it's not even invariant to translations, right? Okay. So you basically apply some symmetry operations, the same symmetry operations you apply to the density to transform it into atom-centered descriptors. And this gives you uh, basically, you know, okay, for the density, we build uh, atom-centered correlations of the density. Here, we build atom-centered correlations of the potential. Okay, and you extract new descriptors from, I mean, new uh, a, a part of the prediction out of that? That's exactly, the... exactly. We, we build new descriptors, uh, and then uh, you feed uh, these descriptors into the machine learning model. Uh, and, and actually, this is, I think, I, I think that, you know, here, uh, with this long range stuff, uh, one has to be careful because there is a risk that basically you go back to training empirical force fields, yeah. right? So here, what we are trying to do is get descriptors that have the correct asymptotics, but then use the flexibility of the machine learning model to also go beyond what you can literally describe uh, in terms of that asymptotics. So for instance, uh, being able to pick up uh, also one over R to the six uh, kind of uh, uh, tails. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much, Michele. So uh, we'll stop here because I know you have a class. Otherwise, uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to. It starts uh, the, the, what is called the quart d'heure vaudois, so the fifteen minutes, the academic fifteen minutes. But oh. yeah, I need, I need to pack and go to class now. So thanks for uh, being flexible, and uh, I hope time I will yeah. be there in person. Yeah.
if you have questions, we'll send you emails and then we'll continue by email. Yes, and you will find the slides here uh, before the end of the day, okay? So, okay. curioti 2022 urlcom before the end of the day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Okay. To back our step back. Um, better. Maybe not. Um, sorry.